Hello, everybody. I am joining you today from an office at my desk. Uh, and for those of you who don't know exactly what I do, I am the graphics designer and video producer for a storytelling radio show. Snapjudgment.org. Now, this mostly involves creating graphics and other promotional materials to go alongside our weekly radio show, but it also involves producing a lot of video content, including short films for the web, and we've also done television specials, which are basically live stave shows shot with multiple cameras, approximately an hour long for TV. I was hating life. This is my computer. It's an old Mac Pro. It's equipped with dual Core 2 based quad core processors along with six gigabytes of DDR2 memory, a three disc, three terabyte RAID 0 array, an ATI Radeon 2600 XT. I upgraded it with a gigabit ethernet port. Basically, it's a piece of that makes me want to on a daily basis. I recently explained this situation to my boss, and after explaining to me that my exceedingly good looks and extraordinary capabilities are valued to this company only second to his delightful on-air personality, I was assured I'd be given whatever I need, valued up to $3,000. And so now, I get to show you how to build a brand new computer for video editing. This is a proper video editing computer. It's equipped with a Core i7 processor, 24 gigabytes of RAM, nine mechanical hard drives, two SSDs, an NVIDIA GeForce 560 Ti, and if you Google the relatively vague term, the desk, it comes up at the top of the list. That has nothing to do with being a good video editing computer. It's just pretty awesome. Now, some of this along with the rather extensive monitor situation might seem a bit extravagant, but video editing is probably one of the most resource-hungry operations you can do with your computer. And it's not about achieving some 3D Mark score for bragging rights or even just making the experience more enjoyable. You can be sitting there for hours waiting for renders and every few minutes waiting for previews. Basically, every bit of performance you can throw at your machine will save you a lot of time and headache when you're actually working. So to give you a little bit of a better idea of what we're dealing with, I have loaded one of our television specials, which is basically a live stage show uh, with about four to seven cameras all shooting a performer on stage. And uh, in this case, they were shot on Canon DSLRs, and right now I have it loaded up in Adobe Premiere, which is what we're using. And just so you know what's going on with the monitors right now, usually you have one primary monitor, which has basically the footage you're working on with a timeline with all your clips in it effects controls or a source monitor. If you pull open a, um, a new clip, it'll pop open there and then you can from there send it to the timeline. And then in my case, I usually like to have a second monitor just for the bins, which is all the video content and stuff you can pull, as well as your effects, which are right here. Also, it's really helpful, not, not everybody uses this, but if you have a full screen monitor, it helps a lot because when you're watching it and you have this split with the timeline, it's very small. And again, this is 1080p video, so you can't really see what's going on with the details here. You see it real time, exactly pretty much what it'll look like on a TV. And then I have a fourth one set up here, which is useful to have, like right now I have the multicam editor open in it, which lets you see all the cameras go at once and you pretty much can cut live like you would in a live television shoot, like on the news or something. And then you can re-edit it in more detail later. But also I like to have this monitor set up for things like folders and windows. I also have like a lot of little Windows gadgets here which tell me what's going on with the CPU and the hard drives which actually has been very useful because occasionally the system will just hang and it could be for 10 minutes and it turns out it's working on something and actually I've left it because I've noticed it was working on something. Otherwise you might think the program freezes but again this is a very resource hungry application all especially if you have Adobe Premiere plus After Effects open plus whatever else. Now we actually started off in Avid which is another great video editing application that's pretty much the one that the big studios use um, for everything and it's a really great application but especially with CS6 which has a lot of improvements that we needed for the show including the multicam which lets you do it used to be limited to four, now it has nine, I think, maybe, I don't know if you can go higher than that, but you can have nine cameras in the multicam mode. And uh, just the way it works is After Effects. And again, for this build that we're doing, it takes advantage of NVIDIA GPUs, thanks to the CUDA technology that they use. So basically before, the CPU handled pretty much all aspects of the video editing, with the exception of 
those really high-end thousand dollar plus uh, Quadro or Fire GL cards. But with CS5 and CS6, a lot of work has made it so the GPU actually helps out quite a bit with um, transcoding different formats of video. Like this is mostly Canon DSLR, but you can also throw in like we did footage from our GH1s. And you know, for the other stuff I do is pretty much 10 different sort of cameras. And sometimes they're at different frame rates and you just throw them in the same timeline. And it looks great and plays really smoothly. And also color correction and the multicam monitor just added support with CS6, I think. So the GPU is doing a lot of work now. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, if you're building a PC and wanting to work in the Adobe Creative Suite with that. So this particular show is about 600 gigabytes, and again, that's on five or six Canon DSLRs for an hour-long show. Some other cameras we've had have gone up to 1.5 terabytes, and then when you're adding other files to the project, it gets pretty big. So most people are building computers right now, and they're trying to use just SSDs, but once you start looking at terabyte sized SSDs, the price is kind of unreasonable. And on top of that, a terabyte for a media drive, at least for this particular show that it works on, um, is not enough. So depending on what sort of things you're editing, um, in this case, we're gonna be looking at creating a RAID array, which hopefully can have multiple shows loaded at once. So that's already two, three or four terabytes big. RAM is also very important, again, with so much media that's being loaded and uh, oftentimes After Effects and Premiere will be open, plus whatever else is going on. And those two programs together need a lot of RAM. Right now this has 24 gigabytes of RAM, and actually it has 24 gigabytes of RAM because the apartment video I did a while ago, that was actually about a three terabyte project. Um, and I had 12 gigabytes of RAM before and I actually had to stop. It would not load the project anymore until I realized it was the RAM was the problem. So now that we know a little bit more about what makes a good video editing computer, we can go ahead and start selecting our parts. Now one thing, probably the most important thing to keep in mind is going to be your budget. How much can you spend on this system? Now I personally, when I'm building my own system out of my own pocket for my own use, uh, like to spend around $1,800 to $2,000. And that'll pretty much get you kind of in the sweet spot of the major kind of components price range um, in terms of if you want basically a little more performance, you're gonna have to start to spend a lot more money after that. And so $2,000 usually gets you in a good place in terms of guiding you to those parts. Uh, however, because this is a computer for business and it's going to be used to make money, it's definitely worth it to spend as much as we can. And in this case, I've been approved for a budget of $2,500 to $3,000. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you're watching this and seeing the components I choose um, and keep in mind your own budget. And in addition to the fact that um, we're dealing with computer parts which are changing prices pretty much every day and new stuff's coming out. Hopefully you're not thinking of this as like a shopping list and you're thinking of it more of a kind of getting you in mind to pick out your own parts again for your own budget and for your own purpose. So to get started uh, on a new build, one place I usually like to visit is uh, newegg.com. And that is primarily because uh, they have a really up-to-date catalog of parts and they'll pretty much have all the new CPUs and GPUs available. And their sorting software and the way you can search through them and the way they're tagged is really great. So that's definitely a great place to start to kind of get an idea. And then after that, what I like to do is check the other obvious places like Amazon.com to see if there's a better deal. Or um, slickdeals.net is a great place to go when you're trying to decide between different brands, like usually once you decide you want a uh, GTX whatever, you have the, you know, you can get the palette, you can get the Asus, you can get whatever brand you want, and they're pretty much all about the same price. But one might be on sale, and that's a great place to find the one that's on sale. The very first component we're going to be looking into, of course, though, is going to be the CPU. And again, with video editing, that is going to be doing most of the work when it comes to time to just render. Pretty much the best CPU you can get is going to do a lot. And this is also probably the one case where I'm definitely a bit of an Intel fanboy, uh, but if you're just looking for raw power, the i7 chips from Intel for the past few years have pretty much been the obvious choice. And you can see immediately we're already greeted with a number of different um, sockets for these processors, so that's one of the reasons you definitely want to choose the processor first because then you're going to choose the motherboard, um, but you got to know what socket you're going to be using first. These i7s, including the new Sandy Bridge, span across a couple of different chipsets. This actually in here, I forgot which exact processor it is, 
but I think it's a 1366 socket. Um, you can see a, you can see they also have an 1155 and then they also have the new 2011 socket. So um, again, with a $2,000 build, usually I'm spending about $300 on a CPU or $350 on a CPU, but in this case, um, I think I definitely wanna go to one of their six core chips. You can see right now there's pretty much only one that is in the affordable range for us, which is the i7-3930K Sandy Bridge chip. And so now that we know our socket, which is that, 20, that new 2011 socket, we can go ahead and start looking at motherboards. So once you bring it to 2011, 2011 again being a relatively new socket, has uh, a relatively small selection of motherboards. And they all seem to be rather pricey motherboards, which is kind of expected because again, this is their newest and best socket. The main things you should consider are going to be probably firstly the size of the motherboard. In this case, it's going to be in an office environment. It's not gonna be moving. Um, and we're gonna want as much expandability as possible. So we're not gonna be looking at mini ATX or any of the other smaller form factor motherboards. We're gonna be looking at full-size ATX motherboards or even extended ATX motherboards would be fine. With these newer motherboards, they're all pretty feature-rich. They all look like they have USB 3.0 and um, SATA 6 gigabit per second and decent sound. So the major thing we're gonna be looking at is probably the number of serial ATA ports. A lot of high-end editing systems have special RAID cards and the main reason for that is onboard RAID kind of has a bad rap in terms of primarily it's RAID 5 option, which lets you get pretty much, you subtract one uh, hard drive from the RAID array and that's how much space you have, but it has to do parity and it has to do data and it offloads that information to the CPU and that usually slows it down. Uh, but what I found is with onboard motherboards, RAID 0 and RAID 1 or RAID 10 um, all work great. So uh, without having to get an $800 RAID card to try to make a RAID 5 work or even a RAID 5 usually isn't even worth it because it's better off to just get a extra hard drive and just make it a RAID 10, which I think is what we're gonna do. So when you take into consideration there's gonna be an operating system hard drive, there's going to be um, at least one optical drive, and then we're gonna have a RAID 10 of some sort, which is probably gonna be a four drive RAID 10. We're already up to six hard drives. I also like to have an additional RAID 0 for like the desktop and um, rendering media onto that as well as like a scratch disk and a scratch disk is basically little files that your project needs that if you lose it it can rebuild it off of the old media you just got to sit there and wait for it to do it um, but that's the cost of a hard drive dying which is not that big of a deal um, whereas of course the main editing drive is going to be a RAID 10 because if you lose that you could lose a lot of money spent on a production so but that's already a possibility of eight hard drives. Another thing to keep in mind for this particular build is going to be the number of RAM slots. The 2011 socket seems to be a uh, quad channel memory system. Um, so some of these motherboards seem to only have four slots for memory as opposed to doubling it up and having eight. Uh, again, we want to get as much memory as we can as cheaply as possible. So making sure there are eight is definitely going to be a big deal whereas opposed to if you were just gaming or something like that um, you get four slots fill them with four gigabyte chips and you probably have enough memory for what you're doing but 12 would not be enough um, in our case while we're at it another one where there's pretty much just a huge selection of that you just kind of want to get the price in mind for is going to be the memory so in this case you can use your motherboard although in pretty much all cases it's going to be um, DDR3 memory. This is one where it gets a little bit more complicated. You might have to do some math. Um, they sell them in various types of kits, whether it be singles, two channel kits, four channel kits. You can buy eight single sticks and that would be the same as buying a pack that came with eight. But on top of that is of course choosing your memory in terms of performance once you figure out the math and how much it is a stick. They have different speeds. Your motherboard will be compatible with many different speeds. 1600 seems to be the best value right now, but they go a little bit higher and some motherboards, especially these higher end motherboards we got, can accept much higher. But for the video editing, I found it's mostly going to be about making sure, if you're working on DDR3, um, just making sure you have enough. 
So in that case, we're kind of picking between whether we can fill it with sticks of four gigabyte or eight. I think in this case, based on the price, it's gonna be a little bit pricey getting eight gigabyte sticks. It's better off just to get uh, four, which will leave us with 32 gigabytes of RAM, which um, from what I know of our projects is going to be more than enough. And that looks like it's gonna end up being about $100 for four, so $200 it looks like we're spending on memory right now. The next big ticket item that we're going to get is going to be the graphics card. And particularly because we're using the Adobe Creative Suite, we're going to be limiting ourselves to NVIDIA cards, again, because they have the CUDA technology that was working so well with Adobe. And if you go to Adobe's webpage, you'll see that they have a very specific list of cards that are approved. Know that there's a very simple and well-known hack to basically make any um, GeForce card that uh, has CUDA support be used by Adobe Premiere and Adobe After Effects and even Photoshop now. So pretty much just shop for a GeForce card and look at the number of CUDA cores it has. That'll kind of give you a good idea of how well they'll perform in comparison to each other. I haven't really found like a good benchmark yet online that somebody's done comparing them. Um, but again, this is a 560 Ti and I think that had something about 400 CUDA cores. And right now it looks like it's gonna be the GTX 670. Uh, which is about $400. I normally spend probably around $350 on a graphics card. Um, but you can see right here, the 570's got 480, and then you go up, it's a huge leap to 1344 cores. The only other thing to keep in mind when choosing a graphics card, depending on your setup, if you want a setup like this, at least when I was shopping for my graphics cards for this, the days when the 560 Ti was the best value, which was like three years ago or something like that. Not all graphics cards supported four monitors, meaning even if it had enough video outputs, not necessarily all of them would work at the same time seems like the GTX 670 has enough output that will work so it can power four monitors. My work setup only has three, so I think we're good to go with only one graphics card. What I did here is I had another cheap graphics card that was like $100 that just pretty much drove the monitors. Don't think you can do like an SLI type setup with Adobe. It's, I mean, you can, but it's not gonna take advantage of two GPUs. It's only gonna take advantage of one or your most powerful one. So uh, it looks like we're gonna be spending about three, $400 on a graphics card. Another thing that I almost forgot, which uh, is important to work into the budget right away, is going to be a copy of Windows. You can get the system builder if you're building a system, obviously, or if you're not, you can do it too. Um, you didn't hear that from me. That's just a thing to quickly make a note of to add to your cost. Uh, it's about $130 to add that onto there, so that just takes it away from my budget again. Another thing we need is at least one SSD here for the operating system. Pretty much for the programs in the operating system, 120 gigabytes is great. If you use your desktop a lot, again, I like to move folders like desktop in my videos to the other hard drive, which you can do in Windows 7. Um, some people aren't aware of that. But in this case, I have two 60 gigabyte SSDs back when the prices of 120 gigabyte SSDs were insane. But in this case, you can pick up a 120 gigabyte SSD for about $100. So that's something right now to throw right into our shopping cart. Now I'm leaving the hard drives kind of for last because basically I gotta figure out how much money I have to spend because that's kind of the most flexible. For me at least in particular, obviously we wanna get as much as possible with the hard drives, but it also depends on how much money we have. So the other thing is going to be the case and um, Many of you guys may know I build cases. I'm not gonna build a case for this project, but it gives me a rare opportunity to buy a case, which is fun, sort of. This is one where it's really, I can't tell you exactly what to buy. There's, it's, it's really a lot about aesthetics too, what you like, um, and there's a lot of choices. We're gonna want a large case. I'm just gonna want a lot of room to work. No need for a handle or anything. It's not gonna be moving. Um, there's not a storage issue, so it's going to be a full tower case. Obviously different, there's different build qualities. The cheaper you go, actually, they, I mean, they sort of work fine, but they're a little bit flimsy. But again, some people just tuck their case in a cabinet. Airflow, I think, is definitely one thing that's going to be important. I'm gonna be trying to probably overclock this a little bit. Obviously, again, with the full tower, there's gonna be a lot of hard drives in this, so I have to keep an eye to make sure there's enough spaces for hard drive, but with full towers, pretty much will make it work. I've spent as little as like $50 and gotten a decent case, but 
um, they definitely have the flimsier kind of feel to them. I think we have enough money again to go probably with a little bit of a nicer one, and especially because there's a bunch of Macs in the office. I don't want to like have this representing PCs poorly, you know. See, you got a PC, look how hideous it is. Some cases come with PSUs, but in this case, I don't think ours will. So here, we're gonna go ahead and look at power supplies. This computer in here right now had a, actually I was running it with just a 550 watt power supply, and eventually it started doing weird stuff, and I realized it because it didn't have enough power, so I added a second power supply. But you can see everything that this is loaded with, 550 almost did it. We have a pretty big graphics card on this one. I think with around 750, again, we're not doing an SLI thing, pretty much the thousand watt and above is for people doing crazy SLI configurations. Um, a good solid 750-ish or 800 watt power supply I think will be great. This is one thing where a lot of people warn about buying cheap powered supplies and you might want to look into that, but I also can't lie. I've always notoriously spent as little as possible on power supplies. Um, and in my experience, I think I've had like one or two fail and when they fail, you replace them. Some people say it will destroy the system and maybe that does happen. You might want to do that depending on how, you know, how you're feeling and how, how much you like to gamble. But um, I also can't lie and, and say that I, I have spent like $20 on a power supply and it's worked great. In this case, again, I'd love a modular power supply just because they're great and they're much easier to work with. But I think it's going to be a closed case and you're not going to see inside. So um, if it saves us some money, that's not necessary in this case. Also with the more expensive power supplies is going to be power savings, the, how efficient they are. Um, as well as how much heat they generate. The other thing we need to sort of look at is going to be a CPU fan and heat sink. That particular processor we bought, the uh, Intel Core i7-3930K, the 2011 processor for the first time, I think normally they always came with a Intel heat sink, which most enthusiasts would just throw out, including myself right away. Although I should say, if you get one with a heat sink inside and you're not gonna be overclocking, it could work fine. In this case, we have to buy one. And in this case, I think I'm gonna wanna try to overclock it quite a bit. So one thing I'm seeing is a lot of self-contained water cooling things. I've actually never done a water cooling system before. Um, and these seem to make it pretty easy. And low maintenance, which has always been kind of my turn off for the water cooling, having to fill it up and there's like a reservoir or something and you have to order the pump and you have to order the tubing. But apparently these are all self-contained and perhaps worth a look. Otherwise, you might want to look at more traditional heat pipe coolers. It looks like with the 2011 socket, you might want to pay attention to clearances because the way the RAM is settled around the CPU, there might be clearance issues. And of course, with buying any CPU, you might want to check the support. Not all CPUs, especially older ones, will support every single socket. But I think I'm going to try out one of these water cooling setups with this one. And again, we have a case that um, should have plenty of room for fitting one of these systems or anything else. And so I don't want to bore you with every single little thing for this build, but you're going to have to look at your case. You're going to have to look at everything and make sure you have everything. Usually you have to buy a lot of little accessories. You might need some extra 120 millimeter fans, uh, thermal grease. Uh, you might need some screws, hardware, stuff like that. It's good to set aside about $100 for little accessories like that. And it looks like after adding everything up, it turns out we're probably going to have enough money to do some fancy RAID arrays for this build. In particular, that four drive RAID 10 that I was talking about, which is going to hold the video footage that we shoot that's going to be edited. And that's gonna basically copy it twice. It's gonna be a RAID zero with two drives and then copied. So it's gonna be safe, it's gonna be fast. So that requires four drives, probably two terabyte drives, anything smaller would only be a three terabyte array. And that for the sort of work we do is not really enough. So this will be four terabytes and that should be good enough. In addition to that, we also have a little bit more money and I think I'm going to get an additional RAID 0 for desktop and just play space for media and also act as a scratch disk um, instead of putting that added work on the other array. And if that dies, it's a RAID 0. It's not a big deal. So it's just a matter of finding which drives you want. So a lot of green drives are on sale. In this case, we want them to be as fast as possible. They don't necessarily have to be uh, SATA 6 gigabit per second, but they should definitely be 7200 RPM drives, these green drives from Western Digital or the 5400 RPM drives from uh, the other companies are not really gonna be recommended. 
So it looks like uh, we're gonna be getting pretty close uh, up there to our budget of $3,000, but now that we have kind of exactly sort of what products we're gonna get in terms of size of hard drives and everything, next step is of course to pick your exact uh, models and from where you're gonna get them and you can go ahead and order.